Veterans History Project interview with James Wallace Jennings. Today's date is the 14th of August, 2003. The interview location is Pampa, Texas at the Freedom Museum. James Jennings served in the Navy during the Pacific. He was a signalman third class. The interviewer for today will be Tony Lupo. Could you describe when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, we, uh, when we heard about Pearl Harbor, we had it radio at that time. No television, but we had a radio and we heard it that morning. And my dad, being a veteran of World War II, immediately decided that he would want to help whatever he could do in the war. So he joined some people in Mineral Wells, Texas, building the Army base, sir, and stood guard at at the Army base in 1941, and I farmed. And at that time, I was uh, 14 years old. Interesting. So, um, could you explain how you got into the military? Well, I was dra I was drafted. I remember the day that I that I went up to to enlist or be enlisted, and. Uh, the draft board man told my dad, said, Sam, you can have him for three more months if you want him. And he said, he's already told his mother goodbye and I'm ready to let him go. So we left the, our county seat there in Knox County, which is Benjamin, Texas, and went to Lubbock, where I was interviewed to see which branch of the service that I'd like to be in. And when they asked me if I had a choice, I told them, yes, it was the Navy, and he said, you're in the Navy. So I went in the Navy and immediately after our induction there, we boarded a train and spent three days en route to San Diego, California. What made you decide to join the Navy? I just thought that I'd rather be in the Navy. My dad was in the Army, but I thought I'd like to be a sailor, so I just thought I'd join the Navy. Could you describe the sort of training you received and what you ended up becoming after the training? What what role you served? At the time we were drafted and went in, they were calling men in the age of 30 to 32 that already had a family. So I, I went with a group of older men and they kind of picked me up as a mascot. We were they were shoving sailors through boot training in three weeks. And we were taking what normally you get in six weeks in three weeks. So it wasn't easy. They, uh, they double-timed us, they run us, they swam us. Uh, I mean, they tried to put us in combat conditioning in three weeks. And immediately after San Diego boot training, we were sent to North Island, which is just north of San Diego, and taken uh, advanced training. And there we learned how to swim in water with uh, fire on top, and I'll never forget the first porpoise I ever seen. The whole crew was just like me. They'd never seen a big fish in the water, and they thought it was a shark, so we run over all the guards getting out. But we, they talked us back in, and we went ahead and made our, our swim that morning. So um, what did you uh, ultimately be assigned to do after boot training? What, what was your uh, role? At uh, as soon as we finished our training, well, we, while we were at Oceanside, mm -hmm. our ship got ready for us when we wasn't ready. The ship they had assigned to put the, the sailors at that time was taking training on, and we missed the ship. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any place to go. So all of those that could come up with enough of money to, to get home and back, uh, buy a ticket to get home and back, got nine days furlough. And that was just two months after I'd been in, in the Navy. So I, I came up with the money, all right, by borrowing it from my, one of my aunts, and I went home and stayed just two days on the way and four, two days back and five days home. But uh, I took the nine-day furlough and went home and back. Interesting. We came back. We were sent to Oceanside, California, to the Marine base, for what they call combat conditioning. And believe me, it was just that. There I struck to be a Sigmund third class. I'd already made Seaman first class, so I decided I wanted to go into communication, so I struck to be a Sigmund, and I went to studying 
Morse code and semaphore, which is visual communication. So, um, at what point did you receive your orders to ship out, and where did you go? We uh, had, we spent quite a quite a while at uh, Oceanside, California, and we had a few liberties, and of course we'd go into L.A. and, and uh, but when we got our orders, we boarded a a train and, and went to San Francisco and went aboard a brand new APA, which we thought was the greatest ship in the world, but it was really just a flat tub that carried a troop to shore. It was an amphibious personnel attack, and it, it would just come off the shipyards, uh, and uh, wasn't wasn't uh, fully equipped. They uh, finished putting the guns and and uh, some of the equipment on the, especially the navigational equipment on the ship after we had went a, went aboard and. After we got the ship ready, they let us take a what they call a shakedown trip down the coast for about one day distance and back and in the in the, to the dock and in a harbor where we was went over with a fine tooth comb to see that we was in ship shape to go into the battle and they they gave us a give us all a a a leave to go ashore and liberty and for the last time and to pick up all the things we needed and that was the last time I went ashore until I came back from from hitting Japan at, in, in the United States. Now I went ashore in Hawaii but in the United States that was the last liberty and <laughs> I'll never forget a couple of our friends was from Tennessee and they were getting guys to bring whiskey on the board because you could only bring one fifth and and they drank whiskey in Tennessee for breakfast. <laughs> so they were they were getting guys to bring them a fifth of whiskey in for them so they'd have another whiskey to store it up to last in the duration of the war. So where'd you guys ship out to? What was your first assignment? We uh, didn't know exactly where we were going but we had a pretty good idea and sure enough we went to Hawaii. The Hawaiian Islands, mm -hmm. and there we uh, trained. We uh, we got to go ashore, and I saw all the ships in the harbor, and it was a pitiful sight. Really? And I went to the cemetery, the National Cemetery, and saw I read all the names that a lot that was lost on the Pearl Harbor attack. And of course, the the battleship that's got so many people in. That's still in it. That's a monument there in the in the harbor now. Uh, was there, but it wasn't uh, cut up or anything. It was just like it went to the bottom. And I uh, I can remember well what it looked like. So we we were right there in Pearl Harbor. In fact, I got to go ashore in Pearl Harbor. I uh, had a cousin that worked in the shipyard there, and. Uh, you, curfew was 10 o'clock at night during the war. Nobody stayed ash, uh, ashore during, during wartime, no matter who you were. But uh, I got with my officer and told him about my cousin living there in Hawaii and, that, and he worked right there where we were docked and he let me go home with him by getting in the turtle of an A model Ford and riding out of the gate under, under cover and coming back in under cover. So I got to stay all night in Hawaii one night. That's a good deal. Um, what sort of training exercises did you guys do in Hawaii? We picked different beaches on the, on the different islands. And it was supposed to be uh, be similar to what we were going to be going into battle on. And of course, we never knew at that time that our battle would be Iwo Jima. But that's what we were training the Marines for. And uh, you can't imagine that, uh, that we, we, they, we took them in just like we were under fire. And they were fully clothed with helmet, guns and all. Just like they would be going in when they went into Iwo Jima. So what was 
your role during these exercises? What sort of duties did you perform? I was just on the boat with the with the with the other three men that operated the boat. Our assignment was a LCVP, which was a landing craft personnel, which carried a ship to shore. Now they, we had two LCMs on our ship and 31 LCVPs. Uh, I uh, when I when I, we got our orders to go aboard the ship, I'm gonna back up a little. I had the opportunity to either go or stay ashore. My lieutenant come to me and said, Jennings, you have chronic seasickness, and you cannot. Uh, I cannot force you to go into battle or go aboard a ship. If you would like to stay here, we we can fix it where you'll stay. And I said, well, I've trained this far with this group, and and I think I'll just go with them. And he said, uh, I'll help you all I can. And so he gave me a special pass to the to the bread locker, to the butcher shop, where I could pick my food. And he carried ashore aboard the ship when I went aboard a box, and he gave it to me the first night, and it was a box of mint leaves. And he told me if I just put one of them under my lip, when we started out in, in rough sea, it would help me from being so sick. And believe me, I got sick every time we moved. So did the uh, did the mint leaves help at all? Oh yeah, they helped. Good. But uh, I got to where I could I, I could uh, I could uh, withstand the seasickness because in, after a little while I'd uh, I'd get all right where I, it wasn't. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be where I wasn't head swim, but I'd I'd be. It's just like our sickness. Sea sickness is something you don't cannot get over. But uh, I could I could live with it. So I I just I just did the best I could, and eat bread, and and I was very careful with the, the food that I ate. So it was uh, wouldn't make my stomach sick. So uh, after the training exercise in Hawaii, uh, what what was your next task? Well, we we woke up one morning underway, and we had all these Marines aboard. Man, we had Marines all over our ship, and uh, uh, we were in in route to Anawita in the Marshall Islands. We really didn't know where we was going, but uh, the history of my ship tells me exactly where I was going. And I remember when we got there, we knew where we was going. But and then we went from there to Saipan, and that's in the Marina Marinas Islands. Mm -hmm. And at Saipan, we took on some more uh, provisions. Mm -hmm. And when we left Saipan, we knew we were going to war, but we didn't know exactly what it was. What kind of emotions were you experiencing? Well, you know, it was real, real hush hush on the on our orders. And uh, the morning we arrived at our destination, I could see 16 inch shells oh four hours before we got even even close to the bay where we were going going to drop anchor. And those shells were just big red streaks, uh, lopping over and exploding. They'd just, just be a, a, in a curve and into the ground and, and an explosion. Then we got close enough we could hear them. And then we got close enough that you could see them fired. But we still couldn't see which ship was firing them. But there were 16 inch shells and there were battleships. And they were laying them in on Iwo Jima. At that time, we were told that we were at Iwo Jima and that we would be making a, a invasion with these Marines that morning at, at uh, 9 a.m. So we were put over overboard about 4 o'clock in the morning with the, with the troops that we were going to take in and we went into rendezvous. And they called us in in waves, and uh, we were the fifth wave. Board our LCVP was 22 communication people. They had walkie-talkie radios, but they were armed with carbines and, and sidearms. And all their 
all their arms, their their all their uh, carbines had a waterproof uh, cover over, them. and that's what we got in our ramp when they were. We went to, after we let them out. When we hit the beach in the fifth fifth uh, wave, they hadn't been not one mortar shell had ever uh, went off in in the five waves. Just, Marines were run, they let Marines just run ashore, no fire at all. And beside me was a LCVP with a jeep in it. And when that jeep started to move off the ramp, they put a a uh, a burst of shells right in on that jeep, and they they blew it up. Hmm. I was out there getting this saw in a fruit jar, so I wanted some of that. He would jeep a saw. They told me it would look like sand, but it was red, and it looks like volcanic rocks. What it looked like. Could you describe the, the scene when he went on shore? I mean, what was the sounds, the smells, well, the sights? Well, the uh, it was just a just a group of just a, a, hundreds of marines just going up on a a place where there was not a tree, no no barricade, nothing to get behind, and just running up there and kind of digging a little hole and getting in this in it for safety and in advancing. And uh, the casualties was high, so high that I, I can't even describe. After that first blast, and, and by the time I got back on the boat and we got back to way, I could see casualties everywhere. And all of them had helmets on, and those Japs were fine shot. Don't you think they were? Hmm. And uh, the first casualty I saw was that morning just before we went in, and the observation plane was flying over us. And I remember how my heart sank. They shot that plane down, and it fell within 10 feet of our boat. And, of course, it went back in the water head first, and it didn't, didn't nobody come out of it. And... At, at 18 years old, I wasn't scared of nothing, but my heart did sink when I, that plane went down and nobody come up out of it. After we got uh, unloaded with the first wave, our fifth wave that we went in, we immediately go back to the ship and reload. And they load us this time with barbed wire, roll after roll of barbed wire, and told us to go back and get it in our rendezvous area and make a circle round and around out there in the ocean. Well, all we could do was just watch what was going on on the bank. We could see a, the shell. We could see that old Mount Shurabacha was had a big cave in, right at the top of it. And that, that gun was on a railroad track, which I found out afterwards. And that's just under where the flag was raised. And they'd run that gun out and fire at that battleship and then back it back up in there and they, they'd, they could shoot in that hole but that gun would be way back up in that hole. They like they never got them out of them caves. They were caves all over that island. <laughs> but after we left Iwo Jima, I want to tell a little bit about some of the casualties. And yes. We had a hospital ship and we had some, some relief come in on us on the second day. And we went ashore, I went aboard and, and got to sleep four hours and had a hot meal, which it, uh, you can't imagine how good that hot meal tasted after being out there just one night. And I know them Marines on the bank didn't have anything to eat, and, and I know how they felt. And all they had was what they had on them and what they could scrape out every, the next morning. Mm -hmm. But we went aboard a nice place and ate. A nice warm meal and went to sleep and when we woke up we had lost our LCVP that that gun cover that was in the in the ramp had let it enough water come in and and the crew didn't realize that it was leaking like we knew it was leaking and we pumped it out with bear's pump but they let it get too full of water so they lost it so we lost our LCVP but we were assigned another one on the way to where we were going at this time. We uh, we left there. The next two days, we took on casualties because our hospital ship was already loaded and gone. And the APAs was converted, those that were in close like us, was converted to hospital ships. So we taken on all the, all the troops 
quarters were full, filled with casualties. And we carried them into uh, the Solomon Islands, I guess. I think that's where, no, to Saipan. We were in the right to Saipan. And we carried them back to Saipan and unloaded the casualties at Saipan. Where we taken on the uh, uh, some some uh, supplies and, and out in the middle of the ocean we had supply ships that had come by and and supplies uh, during the during the war time and we never traveled in a straight line. We was thirty one ships in our division and we were the the flagship of the division forty eight and and. Uh, I was on a, my APA was USS Talladega, APA 208, and we run what we call a zigzag course. If you draw a straight line, you zag, zig, and zag across it until you get to where you're going. You go so many, so many miles in that degree, and then so many miles in that degree, but you never go straight. That was so they couldn't pinpoint where we might be going, and. We run a zigzag course everywhere we went during the war. We could make about 12 knots. It was about as fast as that ship would go. 20 knots is is a, is a, a enough to, to get you quite a pretty good, but uh, loaded and uh, underway about 12 knots as fast as those APAs would go. Uh, it took a long time to get four or five hundred miles at, at 12 knots. Yeah. We uh, loaded supplies at Taipan and we went in two or three different places in the Esperito Santos, which is a place that's where uh, the people are, are red-headed and black teeth and uh, they look like a native Africans kindly but they're, they're, they're or uh, uh, people that uh, are not educated or domesticated like us at all. And we we got to go ashore there. I saw some of the things. And then we went to, to uh, Palooka Bay. And we picked up the 165th Regiment Combat Team of the 27th. Army Division, and we left there on March the 25th and was en route to the Carolina Islands. Now we we spent some time on the Carolina Islands, but I don't really remember what for. Well, it was just uh, to to train the. I don't remember training the army, but it could have been. I remember. The typhoon with the army and how sick everybody got. And I remember one instance that everybody on the ship was sick and the mess hall was a terrible, terrible shape. Everyone would try to eat but no one could keep food down. And me, I was just about as sick as they was. But to, to keep up the humor with them, I went to the to the butcher shop and got me a big old greasy pork chop and I tied it to a on a string and tied this string on a stick and I'd go up on deck and there'd be a, one of those soldiers over hanging over the rail and I'd pat him on the shoulder and say, buddy, how about a pork chop? Well, he'd take a swing at me, but all I had to do was just shake that pork chop at him and he'd grab his stomach and grab the rail again. <laughs> it was just humor, but I remember that incident real well. It was uh, some of those, those kind of Incidents that you you go through during the war that you can make it real bad or you can make it real good. It's just up to you. And as a humor, I did to just try to keep some of them a little happy, and they, it wasn't it didn't work out too good. <laughs> but anyway, we we had the army now, and we were headed to Okinawa, and we went into Okinawa. And we went in the day that we lost 90 destroyers on the picket line. The Japs was really, really trying to hold Okinawa. And we had a picket line out there of destroyers. And they hit us that day with everything they had. And we had lost 90 destroyers. 
we came on in with them with our troops and got pretty close to shore, but the battle was down the island from us to my right, and it kind of the island kind of turned and went around where you couldn't see land any further than just so far down. And I remember right after we had docked and we still had the troops aboard, we went under general quarters, which any time we were under danger, we'd go under general quarters. General quarters sounded and I ran up on the bridge where I was supposed to be doing general quarters and I saw this boat coming toward us, a little speedboat and nothing but waves in front of it. And it was running like 90 miles in the yards of us before they blew it up. And it was headed straight for us. It was going to run straight in us with, into us with that, with that charge. Suicide boat. Suicide boat. We went into general quarters again. And we got the spotlights out and we found some swimming around the boat, around the ship, with uh, explosives strapped to them. They were, they were suicide. They were trying to strapped the explosives to us and blow us up that way. It's terrible to see a man blow it up in the water, but, but there, what else could you do? You have to, you can't let them get to you. So we had to shoot them out of the water with an explosion zone. Did you think that that was such a sheer act of desperation that we'd probably win the war? Well, I, I almost knew we was going to win the war then, because uh, there wasn't any doubt in my mind to start with it was going to win the war, but uh, the casualties were heavy. Uh, we can't, you can't imagine the casualties that we had both Iwo Jima and Okinawa. But uh, we knew we'd lost a lot of ships that day, that day so uh, later on in the night that night we went to general quarters again and uh, there was a bomber came over, a Japanese bomber, and we lit it up. The, all the Fifth Fleet were in the harbor. We went back in bay. And uh, everything went to shooting at him. And he was way up there. It looked just like a toy up there with those li all those lights. And uh, it, the, the, it finally was knocked out of the air. But directly the shrapnel started falling back on us. And if we hadn't run and took cover, a lot of, a lot of them got wounded wounded by our own shadow being coming right straight down. We shot that right straight over us and with everything we had and uh, the shadow was deep enough you could sweep it off the deck next morning. <laughs> you, so, you know, they have, we have some experiences and uh, I'm sure the same kind of experiences are, are was everywhere, during, especially during the, the war with Japs. We uh, we were out out of uh, uh, Okinawa for a little while, and we came back in. We went out because of a typhoon, mm -hmm. and uh, I've never I've never rode water that looked like mountains before, mm -hmm. but it looked like mountains. I could look down and see a ship down below me that would look like it was a mile below me. We had uh, had lost our mail there. We were supposed to pick up our mail, and that's the first time we'd got any mail since we'd left Hawaii. I, I didn't get, I know my mother had sent me some food, and I didn't get it. We finally got back in there after the typhoon and, and picked up our mail after we'd secured Buckner Bay, and, and it was a naval base then. Well, that's where we picked up our mail. We left there and we went to the Philippines and we started training troops again. There was no end to training troops. We were constantly training troops for something. We were training the troops that we had to hit the mainland of Japan and we knew that. They didn't keep this from us. We trained oh, we trained for th 15 to 20 days and then they'd give us two or three days off and we'd go to one of the big cities. We were in Subic Bay, so we went to Manila the first time and we had, had liberty. Half the first day and half the second day. I took both days and I had to work it around to do that, but I did that and I got in a little trouble, but I got out of it all right. So we, we went back and went to train again and we trained uh, in Subic Bay 
and they, they went to Subic City for for uh, liberty after a couple of more weeks. And I didn't get to go because I'd fouled up in the first one and they caught me and they, they went in and let me go ashore at Subic City. But I went ashore anyway. I we we went up we'd go over and have a picnic every once in a while and they'd give us three cans of this three two beer and and a sandwich and we could play on the beach and have a kind of a picnic. And it was just kind of a recreation for us. But when we got word the war was over, we uh we just didn't even have to sleep that night. And we got the word always oh, in the late in the afternoon. And uh, the next day we got up and we thought, well, it's over. We don't have to do anything. Uh, we didn't have orders to stop training, and we hit the beach with them guys just like we'd been doing every day. And all day long, of course, we we griped about it. But then that night, we got up the next morning. We was underway. And. Now, the word was that we was going to Japan, so uh, everybody was all enthused about this. And then they turned us back. And we went back into the port where we were when we left and found out that they were, we were, there was a typhoon in, right in our route and they had delayed us for one day. The next morning we got back underway and went in to, headed for Japan. Three days later, we uh, we had the 41st Division of the 186th Infantry on board, and we were carrying them in as occupational troops into Japan. And we, they didn't keep it from us. They told us we were going to be the first ship to dock in Japan when we got there. Our captain had been a captain of a Navy ship in the Philippines when he lost his ship. And he had come back into service aboard an APA. And he'd asked Admiral Halsey for the, for the privilege of being the first U.S. ship in the Navy to dock in Japan. And Admiral Halsey had granted our Captain McMenemy the, the privilege of bringing the first ship in the U.S. Navy in Japan after the war was over. We carried the occupational troops into Japan went right by the U.S. Missouri the day they signed the armistice, close enough that I have uh, photographs which will be on this interview uh, from my ship to the USS Missouri. We, we docked our, ourselves. We had no pilot boat or no deckhands to secure the ropes. We put boats over the side that carried them, carried the, carried the, the crew on the on the dock shot lines to them, and we secured our ship ourselves. In doing so, we picked up some loose floating telephone poles, and and got some of them between the prop and the and the rudder, and kind of twisted our prop down pretty low and. In fact, what it does, it just kind of shaves the end of the prop off. And, and after we got the troops unloaded and, and went in Japan, we had to go back to the Philippines and go dry dock and get a new prop or new screw. We call it screw. It's a prop, but it's with Navy, it's a screw. We had to get a new screw on our ship. We uh, started, at that time, we, we started picking up all the people that had been overseas a long time and transport them, we acted as a transport to come to the United States. On the first load, I had enough of, of points by being the miles, the battles, and the, the, I don't know exactly what, how your, the points came, but it was by the days you served by the battles you'd been in and the miles you had been on sea. And I had enough points that they wouldn't send me back on the second trip. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I was sent over to the Navy uh, uh, where I was uh, going to be receive a discharge and they sent me, I asked to be discharged in California and they had to, 
had to kind of in, inquire why I might want to be discharged instead of they send you back to the closest station where you were enlisted to be uh, discharged at. And I told them I'd like to be discharged out there and I might get married out there. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't a good enough answer for them, so they said, you're going back. They sent me to Norman, Oklahoma. My separation paper shows that I was discharged February, I believe it was February the 1st, no, February the 3rd of 1946, and that's two days before I was 20 years old. I'd been 90,000 nautical miles and made these battles. This is my story, okay. and I hope it'll, it'll help somebody someday understand what we went through during World War II, and especially in the Pacific. I'd like to uh, just ask a few follow-up questions before we end the interview. Yeah. First off, I want to thank you again for coming down here. Um, what was your, when you were part of these invasion forces, you looked around, you talked about the 5th Fleet. Describe to me what that fleet looked like. How did you feel oh, when you looked around? The 5th Fleet was, a, was, I can't tell you exactly how many, how many ships were involved in the 5th Fleet, but the U.S. 5th Fleet was under Admiral Halsley during the World War II. Halsley had uh, in his command every ship that was in that fleet. The battleships, the cruisers, the, the destroyers, the submarines, and the troop transports. Now that was considered, uh, we had LSTVs, we had LSTP, we had, we had torpedo boats. Uh, all of this was included in the 5th Fleet. Aircraft carriers, I forget how many, four. I think we had four before by the time the war was in the, you see we lost enough aircraft carriers to start with that it took us a long time to get back with her. But I think that we had four aircraft carriers that was in our fleet. Never was we all together at one time. Okay. Never. We, uh, like at Okinawa we came in, the fifth fleet was all around us. We went into Iwo Jima, the 5th Fleet was there bombarding the land. Uh, Is it a pretty impressive sight We though? travel with troops. We have escort. Okay. We had cruiser escorts and destroyer escorts. But uh, when we traveled without that, we traveled alone. Lots of times we were just 32 ships, Division 48, traveling from one destination to another. But constantly was we always uh, near enough to the field fleet that we had protection some way or another. Okay. Our, we never lost very many APAs because they, the Jap didn't think that as a, as a, as a hazard to them in the war. See, we, we carried APA was amphibious personnel attack. We only carried people from ship to shore. We had to own our board, on board our ship for protection. We had a quad 40 in the front. In the front, We had two 20 millimeters, one on each side in a gun tub. And right in the center of the back of the ship stood a five inch uh, a gun, just a, a full five inch. And we could, uh, we could protect ourselves just a little, but not very much. That's not any protection, hardly any. You mentioned suicide boats. Did you see any kamikaze attacks? I didn't see any kamikaze attacks. Uh, they, I've, I've, I've heard of them, and I was close enough that some of them happened. Like that day we went into Okinawa, there was 90 destroyers lost, and they were all suicide attacks. All kamikazes, everyone went down the stack of a destroyer. That was the biggest loss the Navy ever had in one day was the day we, we arrived at Okinawa, and that was the 22nd day of the war. We'd, we didn't go in at the first, of, I mean, the 22nd day of the Battle of Okinawa. Hmm. We had secured almost half of it by the time we got there. And there was still fierce fighting on the, I'd say the north end, but it, I'm not sure. The latitude and longitude is something we went by all together. And uh, the way we were docked is on my right at the end of the, of the island. That, was still held and it was uh 
wasn't but about 12 days after we were, we came in that we secured Okinawa. What was your impression of the Army troops versus the Marines? Was there any difference or are they about the same? Well, do you know uh, the Navy and the Marine <laughs> are closer than the Army? Always have been. I mean, we had the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and the Marines. I, uh, they, they were combat trained at just one, just as well as the other. I think, uh, I think it had been awful hard for the Army to take Iwo Jima. And it wasn't easy for the Marines to take it. Their, their casualties were like 90%. And that's, they don't tell that very often. But I'm telling you that that's so. I saw so many of those troops that were shot right between the eyes that it, you can't believe it. And I have some pictures here of some of the some of the airfield that we took. Now these pictures that, I've, that I'm talking about now, I didn't take. Here's some pictures that I've got from other other people that I put in with my group of pictures that I. The ones off the USS Missouri I took myself. But yeah, I just, I'm gonna put these in front of the camera real quick. The um, uh, here's a the whole ship got we took. Uh, so this is a picture. This on is the picture USS taken, Missouri. And this is your picture. That's my picture. That's absolutely incredible. And I'm going to show the other one. The, uh, if I can find it. Yeah, it's right there somewhere. Okay, two. Here it is. And uh, that's amazing that you are, you are close enough that you're actually able to take what looks like a news file footage because you are right there. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, this, uh, this picture right here is just, see, after we, we pulled our pictures and everybody on our ship got a, got a picture of pictures that other people had taken. This is how I got this picture was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was made for everybody. Good. All these pictures. Uh, and of course, this is a uh, picture of you. That's me. this in front. Way back then. Yeah, I was already it. a signal. That wasn't when I first went in. I'd already got a third class petty officer rating there. What What was your impression of your um, fellow crewmen, your fellow officers? Oh, we uh, we all got along real well. We had recreation on the ship too. You know, we we do we didn't train every day with those troops. Uh, it, it you know it was like five days a week. We had a couple of days. I remember going a shore in Hawaii and getting some pineapples and everybody give me the money and the, the officer let me take a ship a boat and go to the dock and the, and the man that owned the factory met me and carried me to the pineapple canning factory and thumped the pineapples and picked out all the ripe ones and I remember how my mouth broke out from eating too many of them pineapples <laughs> but you know that's something that's a different food than our navy food so everybody wanted some fresh pineapples and they're all really good when you when you get a fresh pineapple, this this cup. Um, you talked about being able to go on shore on different islands at various times throughout the war. Um, what are some of your most memorable experiences besides the one you talked about? I mean, for example, what did you do to entertain yourselves on it? Well, it was always entertainment where we went. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just tell you about one instance. I we were over at Subic Bay, and we they gave us a liberty. So me and my little buddy, who was a the the captain's yeoman. Now yeoman is a person that that uh, carries letters and, and anyway he was he was the captain's yeoman. And I was a signalman and I, we carried when we go ashore over there we'd carry cigarettes and soap and stuff like that and trade it to these Filipinos. Mm -hmm. Well I had some soap and cigarettes and he did too and. We run out there and we're going to have a picnic that evening, so there's always some Filipinos out there in boats. And I whistled this one, he wheeled a world in there, and we got us board, and he took us over to this city. And I traded my soap and stuff off for goodies, and and we stayed too long. When we come back, the ship was already, the boat was already gone. Well, we looked around, and I saw one coming, and it was a our lieutenant, and he said, I'll come after you also. 
he picked us up and said, y'all just go on us when you get it board. And when we started up the, the deck, this old executive officer said, arrest these men, take them down to the galley and said, give them all a shower and see that they ain't got no disease. <laughs> And he's, so, uh, he, uh, court marshals. And, uh, the Captain Joman was, he's the one that carries orders to different places, see. And he was with me. So when the orders come up for, to be tucked before the captain to be signed, well, the Yeoman throw them away. <laughs> and we got by with him. They never did, they never did nothing ever happened about. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but that's some of the things, you know, that we'd, how we entertain ourselves. Um, here's a couple more questions. Uh, first off, you know, you've already talked about it, a number of experiences that you went through. After all this time, it's been over 60 years, what, what sort of experiences or what are the experiences that just are the most vivid, the ones that stand out after all these years? Well, the most vivid experience I had on that ship was when those few Navy guys tried to initiate us when we crossed the equator. Ordinarily you have an initiation and it's pretty bad. And all, all the shellbacks, as they're called, anybody that's been across before is called a shellback that's on the ship. And all that hadn't been across is called polywogs. And we have 450 polywogs and 30 some shellbacks, so they didn't have a chance. And they tried anyway. And I had a, I had a fire hose, and I was, I was, I was knocking them down with water as they come out. The, I was on the, I was on the very top deck, and I was, as they come out the door below me, I'd catch them and throw them into the rail. When the old executive officer come running out there, I didn't see him in time, and I hit him, and I carried him plumb to the rail, and he went, he was a. Sweden anyway, and he went to, you got to know where, you got to know where. <laughs> Do you think that's why, was that the same when I tried to court-martial you? Yeah, it, they didn't know there was nothing, to, <laughs> there was nothing they ever done about it because uh, they couldn't handle it. Right. We right. Just, they finally just give up. <laughs> and the funny part about it was the ship that my friend was on called and, well, uh, visual communication just asked if they wanted them to send a crew over to help him take care of his ship, <laughs> and that was that was the, and he boy he was mad about that, and he said no, I'll take care of my own business. Boy, right. we never got initiated. We got our certificate just like everybody else, but <laughs> we didn't get no royal barber shop treatment or yep. all that other kind of treatment they give you. Good. Cat and nine tails and <laughs> greed greed monkeys and all that. It's, um, All that initiation is just about the same, I found out later, but uh, it's a, uh, and it, it, that's a, it's a fun deal for him. It really is. I can understand it. Cool. Um, how did your service and experiences during World War II affect your life? Well, you know, I was just a kid off a farm, and, and I grew up in two years. I drank enough of whiskey to float a battleship. I lost my voice from it. I was a whiskey tenor for 35 days. Never could say a word. Uh, the experience I had in, in those two years is more than most people have in 50 years. And, and yeah, I, I, I think it uh, made me have an outlook on life and knew what I had to do. And I grew up from as a grown man by the time I've been in there 22 months and served. And I, uh, I'd say this, I don't think it, service hurts anybody. And I feel like, now my boys were both raised during the time when there wasn't any need to go to service. Didn't neither one of them go. One of them couldn't have went because he was a, had heart problems. I lost him when he was 40 years old. But, but the other one is still alive. And, and he was raised during the time when, when all these guys didn't believe in war. They thought, felt like they wouldn't want to go if they had a chance. And I didn't. Uh, I don't 
I feel like it did done him good if he don't win. Mm. You know, I believe everybody that went to service has went to service and served their country comes back with a realization more than they had when they left. Could you uh, briefly explain what you wanted to do after the war? Well, right after the war, I went right, right back home and and uh, rented an old sandy land farm, 160 acres, and put in a crop. And the fourth day of July, my cotton blew out. My maid brought $20 a ton and my waterman brought 50 cents a piece. And it was pretty disheartening. At the end of the year, a man came along and offered me a way to get out from under that debt I had at that farm to let him have it. So at that time, I've seen no other alternative for me. I uh, sold it to him and came to the Panhandle of Texas and went to work. And I worked in the oil field. I've, I started working in Dumas, Texas as a finishing concrete for a concrete layer. Mm -hmm. And I went to Hartley and built the co-op building and laid brick. And then stood around the pipeline far for days and got hard at pipeline and went to pipelining. Went to work in a refinery, Dumas, Shamrock Refinery. Got me a welding machine and made a welder. Opened my own business and welding shop and was self employed from that day on. I ended up being in business in Pampa, Texas, was tank business for 20 years and retired. I am a Baptist. I served as a deacon in Calvary Baptist Church for a number of years. I'm a retired deacon. I, uh, my health has held up real good, and I have no, uh, no effects on my health from the war. I, uh, I'm a member of the VFW, and and uh, I'm a 33rd degree Mason. Mm -hmm. I belong to Top of Texas 1381 and Lubbock Consistory and the Border York Rides. Sounds like you've, you've led a pretty busy and full life. I, uh, I use a Veterans Hospital in Amarillo for my most of my medical work, mm -hmm. and I get all of my all of my prescriptions through the veterans in Amarillo, mm -hmm. the VFW, well, the Veterans Hospital. Is there anything um, that you'd like to add that has not been covered in this interview? Well, I might say that I married a little girl up in Dumas, Texas, when she was still in high school. 17 years, and we've been married 53 years now. All right. And uh, we had three children, two boys and a girl. We lost one of our children in 95. Mm -hmm. He has a wife and two of my grandchildren here in Pampa. And my daughter had two daughters, and my son had one daughter. So I have one grandson and five granddaughters. And they're all living right in our area. Must be nice. I want to thank you for coming in today. It's been an honor to talk to you. And uh, I really can't thank you enough for spending this past hour just getting this stuff on tape. I really do. Well, I hope that uh, it, this tape someday will give somebody a, a, the record of that that they don't from me. Well, let's put it this way. If the tape wasn't made, and the record wouldn't be there, That's and right. no one would be able to see it. I want to thank you for having me oh. and putting this on. Right. You guys, are great to take time. You have to take time to do this kind of stuff. And it's, uh, it's a labor of love, There's no doubt about it. You go ahead and fade this out.